I'm Robert Polito of the New School Writing Program, and it's my immense pleasure to welcome you to this extraordinary evening with Kave Khanum, featuring two superb poets, Jennifer Chang and Lillian Yvonne Bertram. And our moderator tonight is Kamone Felix. At the outset, I want to thank Nicole Seeley and Elizabeth Bryant at Kave Khanum. At Kundiman, I want to thank Kyle Lucia Wu and Joseph Olegaspi. And at the New School, I want to thank Ben Fama, Laurie Lynn Turner, Victoria Richards, and Elizabeth Lothian. Contemporary American poetry is impossible to imagine without the poems of the multiple generations of young poets who have arrived via Cave Canum over the last two decades. The Cave Canum emphasis on craft, on creative legacy, and on poems that are as formally inventive as aesthetically audacious as they are socially, culturally, and politically engaged, has transformed and continues to transform the art in decisive and powerful and irreversible ways. So um, tonight's introducer, um, who will we'll take it from here, is Elizabeth Bryant, Program Director at Cave Canem. So please join me in, a, in welcoming Elizabeth. Good evening. Can you all hear me? OK. So I'm Elizabeth Bryant. I'm the Programs and Communications Coordinator at Cave Canem Foundation, um, which, as you heard, was founded in 1996 as a home for black poetry and has since grown into an international hub of so many voices. Um, we serve a direct audience annually of over 4,000 through programs such as these, which intend to enlarge the literary canon. I invite you all to stay in the loop, to sign up for our mailing list in the back, visit our website, kavekanampoets.org, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at kavekanampoets, where we post updates about prize deadlines, workshops, events, and much more. This event is also presented alongside Kundiman, an organization dedicated to nurturing generations of writers and readers of Asian American literature. You may follow them across platforms at Kundiman Forever. A few announcements. There are just a few more days left to submit to the Toy Derricotte and Cornelius Eady Chapbook Prize, which seeks to publish an exceptional chapbook length manuscript by a black poet regardless of their publication history. The deadline to submit is September 30th, so tell all your friends. They have a few days to get their manuscripts together. Um, coming up on October 6th at 7 p.m., Cave Canem will be at the Brooklyn Museum for First Saturdays, which presents um, readings in tribute to resilience, the resilience and diversity of Latinx communities, as well as the museum's newest exhibition, Soul of a Nation. Last but not least, on October 11th, um, we'll have the workshop Self-Care, Vulnerability, and Resilience, Disarming Intersectional Microaggressions with licensed psychologist Dr. Nicole L. Jackson. You may find tickets for the workshop on Eventbrite. So I'd like to express, express so much thanks to the New School um, for this wonderful partnership, most especially Lori Lynn Turner and Luis Armillo, even though he's on sabbatical this year. Um, thank you also to Kyle Lucia Wu of Kundiman. We thank our funders, the Lannan Foundation, the Whiting Foundation, Amazon Literary Partnerships, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts. Thank you to Cave Canem's amazing programs and communications fellow, Natalie DeRosier, who will be selling books in the back. And you will also be able to find our fall flyer with the events for this fall and a brochure explaining more about the organization. So now, on behalf of Cave Canem's board of directors and executive director, Nicole Seeley, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's poets who will both read their own work before engaging in a moderated conversation on craft. Lillian Yvonne Bertram is the author of three books and one chapbook, artifacts which she considers to be part of a single life project, all in conversation with one another, all marking unique points in time. In other words, as Terence Hayes notes, Yvonne Bertram's poems 
are touched but never bound by the singular doctrines of narrative. He goes on to say that her poems merge linguistic zeal with capacious imagination. Among her publications are Personal Science, A Slice from the Cake Made of Air, and But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise, all for sale. Excuse me, all for sale this evening. Yvonne Bertram's honors include a 2018 Noemi Press Poetry Award and a 2014 National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Fellowship, among many others. A Cave Canem Fellow, she is an assistant professor in the Creative Writing Program MFA at UMass Boston. Jennifer Chang's poems often emerge from questions she cannot answer. In her own words, the poems don't represent resolution or solution, but a measure of time and thought, a meditation in language and music. Chang is the author of The History of Anonymity, which Arthur Itze calls a remarkable first collection, an acting encounters between what vanishes and what burns in the body and mind. Her most recent collection, Some Say the Lark, won the 2018 William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America. Both of these titles are available for sale this evening. Chang co-chairs the advisory board of Kundiman and teaches creative writing and literature at George Washington University in Washington, DC. This evening's moderator, the luminous Kamon Felix, is a poet, political strategist, media junkie, cultural worker, and recently listed by Black Youth Project as a black girl from the future you should know. A Kave Kanam Poets House and Kalalu Fellow, Felix is an alumnus of the NYU Arts and Politics Master's Program and the Bard MFA Program. A political strategist during the day, Kamon represents high-profile individuals, nonprofits, and advocacy organizations, helping clients influence the local and national issues that matter most to their communities. She's the author of the chapbook, Yoke, and her debut collection of poems, Build Yourself a Boat, is forthcoming from Haymark Haymarket Books in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Lillian Yvonne Bertram. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. And thank you, Kaveh Kanam. It is such an honor um, to be able to participate and to do something with Kaveh Kanam, an organization that was instrumental in my life. I wouldn't be here without Kaveh Kanam. I'm going to read uh, one poem from Personal Science, and then I'm going to read some new work. Um, most of them are computational-based poems that are in my forthcoming manuscript, Travesty Generator. Uh, by, it's going to come out from Noemi Press. A Little Tether. A self being an object, I can construct the object I am trying to get to. Referred to the page, but when left, the page fades to pinks and yellows. To say the hammer was applied to the limb to force breaking is to say there was a wheel. Remember the Catherine wheel? Some said there wasn't any heart in it. Or there was excess heart. Those medieval ones were crazy. The thing is just what's said, the line I try to get to. There are rules even for dreams. The cars are always cars I've driven, and the men, men I've known. My past has value. To the men who never knew me then, if so pretty now, think how pretty when, so newly wounded in a world. They paid for rent, spent hundreds in rare stakes on birthdays. They shined my blackest eyes to wandering pearls. Men away from wives on work trips are simple men with simpler desires. Did I remind them of someone they never netted and spoiled? To the first man who checked me in the corner bookshop at 13 and left $10 at the counter for that girl, Thank you for Vonnegut, Bukowski, and Freud. Men on the shelf of men who tell me what to think, 
men who toyed with drunk too much, drive too reckless, who interpret for me all my dreams. To the man who said I was too much hyperbola, you were right. To the night car salesman who let me test drive to Whole Foods, then paid for my cashews, thank you, you fool, for the boyfriend who made me walk on the inside. Too easy for a girl to get meloned, flesh scooped up and out. And as for the first husband, all his likenesses stowed in family albums, I snuck out and composted with dirty dresses. I've clammed up and now nothing here to test his existence. Husband, what did I leave you for? And what became of those many named goldfish so elaborately poured down the drain? As for you, father, you always had a thing for fairness and better floating boats. Thank you for knowing the marina was the safest place to take me as a child. Where I skipped rocks, learned to pace myself on the fickle docks, and admired the sleepy, teak-decked tombs of other people's money. Facts about deer. Because this is still a poem with an animal in it, and I'm still trying, I might say it offers you its meaty heart with no lasting conditions. If you've seen a struck deer thrash its life out on the shoulder, a burner that clicks without flaming, then you know how they seize to death. Who cares what I think, but I wished just then to have a knife. I wished I knew a little about guns and to own one or to know something sorcerous, because nothing but blood tastes like blood. I've cut myself for its coppery flavor. Only God knows I'm good. My mother says I've no scruples. The way I make no claims to being a permanent person, how my move from husband to ex-husband came on a wave of expediency and self-promotion. If you've gone to the store and left behind a life, the kind that comes with seating, spare change jars, someone's green thumb, then you know how I angered at that woman shrieking behind the wheel of her cracked Ford Escape, phone to face, doe spasming on the shoulder. Someone should knuckle up and kill this deer. A roadway in America and there's no policeman on hand to squash a neck. It's early evening and the sky's poetically blameless gray fills your throat with the thick despair so familiar to the heavily indebted. Mountaineers know you can't save anyone on goodwill that high altitude is minus morality. So, confessionalism. Or, two truths and a lie. I married a man I met on an airplane. I killed that deer. I have no patience for even the most cherubic of children. This next one is an abecedarian um, with some liberties. <laughs> so I th you'll be able to hear both the abecedarian and the liberties taken with it. Um, and it is uh, it's a poem about wheat. And the phrase, which is the title, The Grains of Ascendancy, is taken um, from the writer Paul Graham, who wrote a book about gluten. The Grains of Ascendancy, an Abecedarian. 
Agrigold squares the county roads in miles and not since Solomon is production so biblical, roots deepening into kernels and crops reflecting natural laws. Consider the traits of cops, crosses, and roses, how this scenario reflects all American scientists zeroed in on the diversity of wheats, grains dry, husked, and rubbed to a staticky charge. In this weather so extremely of the late century, I count every presence, every ever-present penis skinning the dialogue, and my fussy bungles the tenure denouement, irritating seasonal growing patterns. Yet the chemicals stagger to their greatness. Yell over the world that the indigenous will inherit the earth and some subsidized custer will till you under with a tweet. I can't breathe for all this modern wheat stoppering my nostrils, and I await the American agriculturists to address the issue of this intolerance. I, too, once loved the mania west of independence. Jefferson City and the world's only corn palace was closed for renovation on my visit. To kill time, I buy a pink police girl cap gun, a five-point tin sheriff's badge. Freeze or I'll light you up. Mankind came to modernity on the whittled backs of grain. Blame schizophrenia on gluten, revolution on night sweats, night sweats on red summer, red summer on red May, red May on the wheat wave, wheat wave on easements, easing open leagues of frontiers, hectares now proofing with bloom, milling, punishes grain and calls it progress. This night is Illinois quiet save for the mill train and alfalfa fields shushing the air. And if I die in police custody, return me to my mother as a cup of rice seeds in a blood-soaked sock. This night is canyon quiet, is Maine quiet, and lobster shell red, the color of battered flesh to change to ever change back. Unhealthy wheat culture means civilization is in decline. And if we're gone, this whole playhouse goes up in smoke. And who left will pollinate these vacant hulls? I see green fields, but I can't seem to get there no how. Wheat can, but we can't winter here. With allies like these, who needs anthrax? Can you survive everything? Centuries in, centuries out, the roller mill restyles colonial week, the germs of revolution relapse to flap like cards in the spokes of Zarathustra. So my work has taken a turn um, towards embracing the computational, which means I use Python to write programs to manipulate text. Um, I don't always use the raw output. I do a lot of editing of the raw output, but so these poems um, are formed using that process and, and computer programs. It's two, but they're a little, not too long. Husband stories, eight. I speak to no one from that past. My silence put to use is the highest instrument. Now even the frost holds my hand. I got rid of the life. It took all the ends to make a no. The distance is here. As for the chandelier, I dig a well. Into the well, I put many men. Seven, there was a husband in the center of this story. Some lunar waves were ringing. I got rid of the husband. Even my ankle rejects you. I never told anyone, not really. The distance is here. Light in a circle could not save me. Six, even the light has aged. The story does not compute. Some lunar waves were ringing. My silence put to use its highest instrument. Now even the frost holds my hand. The things lost with many traces. I dig a well. Into the well I put many men. There are rows of waiting others. 
Five, I speak to no one from that past. Some lunar waves were ringing. What is left of the leaves are stone. Now even the frost holds my hand. I got rid of the life. If I could take it all back, it took all the ends to make a no. Into the well I put many men. That husband is gone. There are rows of waiting others. Four, the story does not compute. There is a husband in the center of the story. What is left of leaves are stone. If I could take it all back, but even my ankle rejects you. The distance is here, the ear up close. Three, the story does not compute. My silence put to use its highest instrument. If I could take it all back, even my ankle rejects you. I never told anyone, not really. It took all the ends to make a no. The distance is here. Light in a circle could not save me. I dig a well into the well. I put many men. Two, the story does not compute. There is a husband in the center of this story. My silence put to use its highest instrument. I got rid of the husband. The distance is here, the ear up close. Light in a circle could not save me. I dig a well. That husband is gone. There are rows of waiting others. One, even the light has aged. Some lunar waves were ringing. My silence put to use is its highest instrument. What is left of leaves are stone. Real gaps spread in the tropic of paradise. If I could take it all back, I never told anyone. Not really, the things lost without traces. It took all the ends to make a no. I dig a well. And this last one, also computation-based, is called Tubman's Rock. Um, it uses a lot of found text, like Wikipedia articles about Harriet Tubman, a few other things. And the epigraph is uh, from Mamie Till. I just wanted the world to see what they did to my baby. Zero. They tied up Till, steal away likely to kill, just stayed dead. Drove toward money, Mississippi, behind enemy lines. The dead trees will show you the way, see us free like Jesus. We just won't stay dead around your house to Moses slowly. When the river ends, steal away. I just wanted the world to see the river bank makes for a good road, that Jesus is a friend with friends. One, Jesus is a friend with friends. The river bank makes for a good road. Moses never lost a passenger. The dead trees will show you the way. They tied up till, steal away and just stay dead. Drove toward money, Mississippi, behind enemy lines. When the wind blows, the first quail call sees us free. And just like Jesus, we won't stay dead around your house. To Moses, slowly, I just wanted the world to see, to holler down the lions in this air. Tracks laid from the south to the north, they tied up till. Steal away around your house to Moses slowly. Set us free and just like Jesus, we won't stay dead. When the wind blows, the first quail calls. Drove toward money, Mississippi. Behind enemy lines, the river bank makes for a good road. Trouble the water, holler down the lions. Bundle of wood parcel, load of potatoes. People also ask, what was Harriet Tubman's life like? I just wanted the world to see, till tied up, stolen away, patter rollers spread throughout the colonies toward promised land, what they did to my baby behind enemy lines. Our Moses never lost a passenger on tracks laid from the south to the north. A friend of a friend of a friend sent me, she said. The river bank makes for a good road. And people also ask, why is Harriet Tubman important to the world? 
I just wanted the world to see flying bondsmen on French leave steal away. They say our Moses never lost a passenger and just like Jesus, we won't stay dead. The river bank makes for a good road. Emmett tied to a cotton gin fan shot in the head from the south, tracks laid to the north. She said a friend of a friend of a friend sent me. The wind blows, the first quail calls. People also ask, what is Harriet Tubman most famous for? Flying bondsmen on French leave steal away. They drove Emmett Till toward money, Mississippi. Behind enemy lines, our Moses never lost a passenger. People also ask, why is Harriet Tubman important to the world? Tracks pressed south to north, she often said, a friend of a friend of a friend sent me. And when the wind blows and the first quail calls, the river bank makes for a good road. I just wanted the world to see. In no rush, the first quail calls. In each pound of dollar bills, slave patrol, also called Patter rollers, patty rollers, patty rollers, patrollers. Three fourths a pound of cotton. Jesus is a friend with friends. To put Tubman on the $20 bill. Our Moses never lost a passenger. The dollar hasn't changed. Three fourths. People also ask, what was Harriet Tubman's life like? People do not ask, who picks the... I just wanted the world to see. See results about the murder of the dollar hasn't changed. People also ask, what was Harriet Tubman's life like? In each pound of dollar bills, slave patrol, also called patter rollers, patty rollers, patty rollers, patrollers. People also ask, why is Harriet Tubman important to the world? Treasury secretary won't stay dead of a pound of cotton. She said, a friend of a friend of a friend sent me, drove toward money, Mississippi, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, in no rush. People also ask, what was Harriet Tubman's life like? In each pound of dollar bills, Jesus is a friend with friends. Treasured secretary, just like Jesus, we won't stay dead. Our Moses hollered down the lions, never lost a passenger. Pound of cotton, slave patrol, also called patter rollers, patty rollers, patty rollers, patrollers. In no rush, I just wanted the world to see. Three fourths of the treasury secretary, in no rush. People also ask, why is Harriet Tubman important to the world? People also ask, what is Harriet Tubman most famous for? The dollar hasn't changed. Money, Mississippi, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. Among our talents to holler down the lions. People also ask, what was Harriet Tubman's life like? Flying bondsmen on French leave steal away. I just wanted the world to see, to put Tubman on the $20 bill. They say Jesus is a friend with friends. And in each pound of dollar bills, slave patrol, also called patter rollers, patty rollers, patty rollers, patrollers, Three-fourths, they say our Moses never lost a passenger. To put Tubman on the $20 bill, just like Jesus, we won't stay dead of a pound of cotton. I just wanted the world to see. Drove toward money, Mississippi, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. What they did to my baby. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much to Kaveh Khanum 
the New School and Kuniman for um, organizing this event, inviting me to come. I'm so grateful for all the work that has that you've done to make spaces for new voices. It's certainly made my reading life better. <laughs> um, I'm going to read some poems from my my book, Some Say the Lark, and then we can talk. The World. One winter, I lived north, alone and effortless, dreaming myself into the past. Perhaps I thought words could replenish privacy. Outside, a red bicycle froze into form, made the world foster in its white austerity. So much happens after harvest, the moon performing novelty, slaughter, snow. One hour the same as the next, I held my own hands or held the snow. I was like sculpture, forgetting or perhaps remembering everything. Red wings in the snow, red thoughts ablaze in the war I was having with myself again. Everything I hate about the world, I hate about myself. Even now, writing as if this were a law of nature. Say there were deer, fleet in the snow, walking out the cold, and more ginkgos bare in the beggar's grove. Say I was not the only one who saw or heard the trees, their diffidence greater than my noise. Perhaps the future is a tiny flame I'll nick from a candle. First, I'm burning, then numb. Why must every winter grow colder and more sure? So much of this book imagines um, imagines um, speakers into the past, whether they're uh, personal past or historical past. And the first poem in the book is actually um, a poem about Thomas Jefferson. Um, I didn't want to write about Thomas Jefferson. I have a long history with the University of Virginia. Um, I spent way too much time there um, as a, a, an adult. <laughs> Um, and I was asked to write a poem about Jefferson and Monticello, and I didn't want to do it for a very long time. Um, and then one day I was uh, visiting a horse stable with some friends, and there was a horse named Never in a stall, um, and it was a beautiful uh, horse, and it couldn't turn all the way around because the stall was so constricted. And this sparked some uh, in some research, and I uh, read about on Jefferson, and he apparently he took better accounting of his horses than he did of his slaves. Um, he had names for all his horses, and some of the names of the horses pop up in this poem. But otherwise, it's it's sort of an atmospheric poem. When I was living in Charlottesville, I always felt like Jefferson was watching over me in a very ominous way. It's just you know you're living in a world of oppression. <laughs> And, and there was a name to it in Charlottesville. Um, and not much has changed there. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> a horse named Never. At the stables, each stall was labeled with a name. Biscuits stood aloof. I faced always, invariably, his clockwork tail. Crab knew the salt lick too well. Trapezoid mastered stillness, a midnight mare. She was sternest and tallest, her chest stretched against the edges of her stall. I was not afraid of never, the chestnut gelding, so rode his iron haunches as far as Panther Gap. Never and I lived in Virginia then. We could neither flee nor be kept. Seldom did I reach the little mountain without him, the easy crest making valleys of indifferent grasses. What was that low sound I heard, alone with never? A lone horse, a lodestar, a habit of fear. We think of a horse less as a history of one man and his sorrows than as a history of a whole evil time. 
I fed him odd lettuce, abundant bitterness. Who wore the bit and harness, who was the ready steed. Or, I think there be six nevers in the field. He took the carrot, words by my own reckoning, an account of creeks and oyster catchers. I named my account Notes on the State of Virginia. It was bred for show and not to race. Never, I cried, never. Were I more horse than rider, I would better understand the beast I am. Our hoof house rested at the foot of the mountain, on which rested another house, more brazen than statuary. Let it be known. I first mistook gelding for gilding. I am the fool that has faith in never. Somewhere a gold door burdened with apology refuses all mint from the yard. So never keeps coming up. The word never keeps coming up. And that was not intentional. Um, I wrote this book over 10 years, and I, I, I just kept writing about it. Um, not the horse, just the idea. Um, but this poem is about uh, the neighborhood I live in, in Washington, D.C. It's about living in an apartment. You hear everything. Mount Pleasant. All night, six vagrants stood at our stoop, chewing the fat out of a too stout story. She did this, did that, took that. She never, 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 never. A white fluttering, a thought like headlights from a passing car, lights up this room where I've never been restful, never still. Outside, the buses must be unrooting. I hear their slow going screech round the corner, engines dying. My neighbor's a dinosaur, Bonnie. She's lived here since the commune days, eats hemp seed, I bet, always gnaws at me. It's not her out there, but she's in my head, the lonely field I imagine each night, awake again, nowhere else to go. Never is a strange design to name what can't be or won't begin. The hours quickening, never asleep. Or the trees silence, encanting, I'll never belong. My silent habit is to listen, for I knew these trees once as a different self. I'll never speak to her again or stand outside like the trees, attending to what's limitless, the sky, stray faces at stray windows. I couldn't hear back then, walking the night forest, not trusting how to follow, how to wend. Now it's the noise of mastery, the mastery of being alive, annoyed. I've said my peace is what I'd like to say, or my peace is still a part of there. I'm bad at idiom, as anyone can hear, as anyone can see. There's an immigrant on my face who makes me stray, makes me tired of you and you and you, all of you, the never outside my window. Here I turn to stone, turn to the body in the dark. I turn mortal and loathsome as bitumen, blacking out a new roof. I turn at Florida Avenue, up 16th. I turn like milk, unforgivably sour, a sudden turncoat. I'll turn on you, my ideology a tourniquet. I turn my face towards your light, alas, the last of which will not return to me. I'm turning off now. Good night, America. Good night, neighbor. I did not know your art was law or that you sailed a boat on the Potomac could parse the grammar of daffodils. Tonight is Sunday. On Friday, you died. Crowding the mailroom with you last week, I wondered whether to note the winter drag, the government shut down again by brief falling snow. Neighbor, I junk circulars and lost hope. I sighed, let my son cry too loudly, Bonnie, Bonnie, rather than turn to you to wish you good night. Dear Bonnie, 
I wish you good night. Dorothy Wordsworth. The daffodils can go fuck themselves. I'm tired of their crowds, yellow rantings about the spastic sun that shines and shines and shines. How are they any different from me? I, too, have a big, messy head on a fragile stalk. I spin with the wind. I flower and don't apologize. There's nothing funny about good weather. Oh, spring again, the critics nod. They know the old joy, that wakeful quotidian, the dark plot of future growing things, each one labeled Narcissus Nobilis or Jennifer Chang. If I died falling from a helicopter, then this would be an important poem. Then the ex-boyfriends would swim to shore, declaiming their knowledge of my bulbous youth. Oh, flower, one said, why aren't you meat? but I won't be another bashful shank. The tulips have their nervous joie de vivre, the lilacs their taunt, fractious petals. Stop interrupting me with your boring beauty. All the boys are in the field gnawing raw bones of ambition and calling it ardor. Who the hell are they? This is a poem about war. I wrote that like seven years ago, and it's increasingly relevant. Um, two more poems. So, I live in Washington, D.C., and I have two boy children um, who are lovely, aggressive creatures. And um, <laughs> this is sort of a, a poem about dealing with um, how, how, do you, how do you teach a boy to be gentle, I guess. I don't know if that's what it's about, but... Um, it's also about Petco. <laughs> it's a little bit longer. Um, inside voice. Everyone is screaming inside is a thought I've held dear my whole life. I picture holes opening up inside and outside myself, the mouth of the earth opening, cloudless holes in the sky. Oh, that I cannot scream. My head empties, stomach gone, a soul lung vacating the body, the gulf of me newly voided. A child has a small voice, I tell my son, as our chorus teacher told me decades ago. And it is not true. He screams down every aisle of Petco, zebra finch, parakeet, angelfish, mollies. He's such a scream, parenting, such a scream. Use your inside voice, I calmly advise, calmly chasing him, calm as the books advise, calm being we want him to become, one of the very calm citizenry. I sing my ditty past buckets of litter, clumping and dust-free, use it or lose it, as if his voice could simply drop to the floor as if I'd snatch it from his throat. Use it or lose it, one says, of resources natural and otherwise. My bargain with the planet, this corner of Petco, where the words, please don't hit me, sputter out of a girl's mouth to a man, her father, or just a man whose fist perch on the ledge of his belt, hawk-like, relentless, his voice swooping down to her, a dangerous pitch. I can only hear punctured consonants, a voice inside and yet too far outside. My eyes catch my son by the cats, each king to a plain plastic box, the calico pacing a brief perimeter, the golden tabby's muzzle learning my son's invading paw. Be gentle, I should say, but my voice makes a poor cage. There is a man and the girl. There is a store clerk, a teenage boy pushing a cart of automatic feeders. There is a corn snake, the Dalmatian rat, the long-tailed lizard, past, present, and future selves. And yes, there are the cats, unwanted, wanting a sunspot all their own. What we know as home, the cats will colonize, stretch their gaze to stake territories, another arbitrary boundary. What we know as home is speculation, the other person who may or may not love you back, depending on the weather, whether the mortgage is paid, the softness of today's boiled egg. I want to scream. 
I want the girl to scream. Look away. The cats will not stop the screaming inside our heads. How do I protect them from my son's rough reach? His voice fills cages with bright admonishing, accusing the cats of what they can't help but be. Cat, cat, cat. I am the cats. The cat is mine. His voice too loud to not stand as authority. Use it or lose it. I'm fuzzy on the antecedent now. His voice my authority, the cat, the girl. It is Sunday, quarter to 10. In my bag, here's inventory, the blankie, the house keys, two stale knots of bread. Who am I to call myself human? And this is the last poem. Um, it's about exotic animals in Ohio. Um, a few years ago, a man in Zanesville, Ohio, released, he was, he'd been keeping um, about 73 exotic animals on his property and released them all into Ohio. And they were wandering around the highways of Columbus. And I had just moved to Ohio. And I thought, this is interesting. Um, freedom in Ohio. I want a future making hammocks out of figs and accidents, or a future quieter than snow. The leopards stake out the backyard and will flee at noon. My terror is not secret, but necessary, as the wild must be, as sandhill cranes must thread the meadow yet again. Thus autumn cautions the cold, and the wild never want to be wild. So what to do about the thrum of my thinking, the dangerous pawing at the door? Yesterday has no harmony with today. I bought a wool blanket now shredded in the yard. I abided by dwelling, thought nothing of now. And now I'm leopard and crane. All's fled. Thank you. I know technology. <laughs> Are we on? I'm on. Yeah, we're on. <laughs> Let's okay. talk. Hi, I'm Camone Felix, the moderator for today. Um, I just want to thank both readers for being here. In incredible work. I was totally astounded. Um, I tend to be one of those people at readings who's just like, oh my god, how? And I had to like really, really contain myself. So I, I want to thank you for like giving me that again. It's been a long time. Um, your work is truly <laughs> enigmatic. And I want to sort of begin with talking about um, the urgency of narrative. Um, because you both really lean into really building out narrative um, characters, um, even your poem, Never. Um, the horse itself was allowed so much space um, to be an animal, to be animate, but also to be a narrative that lived outside of its animation, lived outside of who it was. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about why narrative feels so urgent and so important during this political time and just give you some, some time to think about that. Well, that's a huge question. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, no, I, I, lo I love it because actually Typical I don't, of me. I, don't Sorry. I don't consciously think about narrative and I think of myself primarily as a lyric poet. Um, but I think that narrative gives you context. Narrative gives you a connection to the past. Our, every story is a story that's existed before. Um, and it also, um, I, I think there's a sociality to narrative that pure lyric um, needs because it doesn't, it's not enough. And I think, I, I always think about um, a quote from Adorno. He says that uh, the modern lyric is a subjective expression, must be a subjective expression of social antagonism. Mm -hmm. And I think without, this, without the narrative, you can't identify the character, you can't identify the antagonism um, or what's at stake. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I gesture towards narrative, I think in part out of that impulse, but also just it, I need something more than just a feeling or an image. 
Um, that is a huge question. I'm trying <laughs> <Nice>. to <laughs> um, because I guess similarly, I don't I don't think in terms of narrative that way. Um, although then, when I look at my work, I I do see it, as, especially what I'm doing recently, um, as a strategic response to the the urgent situations of now, um, and they can, those responses can appear narratively. Um, one, th one of the things that I like about how, what I do with computation is the way that it really disrupts and rearranges and challenges different narratives and is able to present them in, in different ways. Um, so it's not always clear what's happening, but it's it's clear like this the the core of the thing I think is there and the urgency is there, um, even if it doesn't come out as kind of a, a straight narrative. Although like some of the programs I use are particularly designed to create a reasonable, followable narrative, um, but then I do something with them so that they don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> and like humans tend to default to linear narratives, right? And they tend to just default to anything that is linear. It's easier in the mind to follow. Or it's the way that the mind is conditioned. Um, and really curious to think about, just going back to you talking about your computation work um, and how it sort of comes out as narrative sometimes, even though it's not necessarily intentional. Um, and thinking a little bit about the role of technology and how we write today. Um, mm. A couple of years ago, when I started to sort of like um, Someone commented to me, they were like, you don't write, like you don't like write poems like in a journal. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> I, I type them. And they were like, how, how do you understand poetry and poetics if it's not coming from your hand? Mm -hmm. um, and it was an interesting question, but also uh, distanced me, I think, from a lot of the poets that I really admire who came before me in terms of generations. I, the computer just is how my brain works. Um, and curious about how you relate to the way that writing poetry has changed and if it's changed for you. Well, I'm sorry. Actually, no, it's, it's um, I'm sorry. I think that, can I? Can yeah, I, yeah go, I, go. Well, I, I wanted to still, I mean, to add, to build on our discussion of narrative and what, what really struck me about your work, Lillian Yvonne, that you read was you use the word confessional, and that there is no easy narrative in those poems, but something is being revealed. And what's so radical about confessional poetry, we, we so often misread it as, oh, it's just people with mental illness. But no, it's, it's, it's uh, sh the shattering of our conceptions of privacy. Um, that when, what Anne Sexton was writing about, abortion, adultery, there are things that you're not supposed to talk about, and mental illness, you're not supposed to talk about these things. And I think there's something about um, how technology keeps conditioning us to mm. reveal and like different forms of confession are also political expressions. Um, like what we have, there are things we have to say mm -hmm. and there are things that we, we and, and just like, just to talk about our current moment, like I have not stopped reading my phone in the last like 10 days since this Brett Kavanaugh bullshit. You know, yeah. I'm like, I, I, you know, everything keeps, like these are confessions that are mm -hmm. terrifying, but also necessary. And they're opening a conversation and a story that we all know about, but no one has talked about until recently. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really, I think maybe that's something about technology and the mm -hmm. past coming together mm -hmm. to, to shift our conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think too, um, at least some of the ways that I use technology is, I mean, it, it, it writes or it allows me to write in such a way or produce something that, in which the stories and the narratives are very iterative. Mm -hmm. And which is not surprising because it's, you know, given our political moment, it almost feels like, um, like we just know the plot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we know the plot totally. and the characters and the themes, and they just do not diverge really all that much from one another. Um, but you know, again, like using it to also, I guess, like reiterate over and over again, like the ways in which those narratives can shift or you know, iteration for the purpose of emphasis. Um, something that the technology can do for me is that it can it can sort 
and it can organize and pull together um, material a lot faster than my than I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in a sense, it's like it just you know it counts faster. Um, but also, it, it, it puts things in different orders and creates, or lets me see different narrative possibilities for the same story um, in ways that I struggle to do on my own. So f for me, at least, I feel like it's expanded a lot of possibilities and potential in terms of how I write um, because it can, very, like, again, very quickly uh, put forth a sequence of narrative possibilities that I, that I might not think of. Did you make a computer program? Like, I'm curious about what computation looks like. It is a computer program. Hmm. And it's using computer code to um, sort of like generate the order of things. Of course, you decide what things <laughs> there are to generate. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it uh, has some of the codes, a lot of them exist in the public domain, they're open access, um, have been designed to put together like a very clean and clear output, mm -hmm. which is not altogether what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the code doing a perfect thing. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in it, you know, not demonstrating itself as like, here's this great code, but in what it can do for me. And it, it gives me more opportunities than I, to make very subtle changes in those iterations. I'm sure you could program it to do that itself, but I'm not that, I'm not very good <laughs> at programming. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of, I'm sort of terrible at it. So, so, I, so I'm not, there's at a point I'm just like, okay, I'm not gonna try and make it like do this thing because I don't know how to make it do this thing. And that's okay. I could do that, that part of it. Yeah, and, and as we're talking about technology and, you know, talking about computation, I'm thinking about output, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and thinking about how you're saying, like, it does it so much faster. And I feel like a lot of poets, I think, you know, a lot of younger poets, too, are thinking a lot about, like, output. How much can I get out? How quickly can I sell that, right? How quickly can I get it published? And just thinking a little bit about how you think about output. You know, where does it begin and end for you? What's the process like? Um, and how do you contend with a new environment that says, put it out, we need it now, get it out of here. Um, yeah, it's really stressful. I say no, I no. say I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I ask for an extension. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I, my output is incredibly slow. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't. Maybe I, need, I, I don't know how to make it faster. And it's partly because I'm a slow thinker. I, I, most of the time, I have no idea what's going on in my head. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I, would say, I would say my output is also incredibly slow. Um, even though, like, the computer does a thing, but that's. It takes so long to get there mm -hmm. <laughs> for me. It really did take a long time to get to to um, to learning, a, you know, a bit more about computation. Um, but you know, sometimes I also think, you know, like the time is now. If some some things have to be out right now because you know, look quite literally, you don't know how long you're going to live. Mm -hmm. um, and for some people, it's actually very urgent. And while I while I am not necessarily like a hot takes kind of person, um, I support I support the now for those for whom it is it is an urgent need or a response to a survival tactic. Mm. So I'm I'm down with it. Yeah, and you know, I also wonder if you if it feels important to be s slow. Right. If it, I think for some people, they are naturally slow writers, mm -hmm. um, and they have for they have figured out why in their poetry and in the way that they understand poetics, why it's necessary for them to write slower. And I'm curious as to if you've, if it feels important to you, and and why, to be slower. To be slower. Um, I don't know if it's important. I, I have learned to accept my rhythm as a writer. Mm -hmm. And what I tell younger writers and students is everyone has their own pace. Um, and the best thing to do is to, is to adhere, to follow it mm -hmm. and to trust it. Because I think the hardest times I had as a writer um, were when I, when I tried to do something that was counter to my 
my natural output. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I wrote faster. Um, and I, I, I like the sense that there is, some people do, I agree with that sense that some people have an urgency. And, and I have an urgency. I, I've been told by a psychic that I was going to die at 42, mm -hmm. and I'm turning 42 next month. <laughs> so, um, Yikes. I know. I'm like totally, yeah, I'm totally fucked. <laughs> um, They're not supposed to be that. No, like. it was a bad psychic. <laughs> um, but, but. <laughs> I want to fight this psychic. Uh, but, but, you know, you're right. You don't, I mean, that, you, I mean, there's urgency, and there's also just your habit of being. Yeah. So I, I think, like, between the two, you have to figure out who you are. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to be out there, and you have to get it out there, and also if you're writing work that's really um, topical, there's some poems that need to be published right now. Um, and I, I, I applaud that. I want those poems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't again I don't know if it's if it's important to be slow, um, like I said, you know I can go I go whole years without writing, yeah. or you know sometimes I'm sick, <laughs> like you know and and I'm not writing or I'm do, I'm just really just doing something else like I'm learning yeah. something else, um, or I'm doing some other kind of creative activity or you know, I'm building something, or whatever. Or you're living. Um, yeah, just life. Yeah. You know, sometimes the urgency is life. So I don't, I don't, I don't sweat the, the slow or the, the speedy about it, because it's all, you know, as I, and I have described this before, it's all, it's all life work, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna, it's gonna take a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as writers, right, as, particularly as poets, we tend to be culture workers and we build culture um, around where we are um, and I think you know talking a lot about you being in Virginia and being like I've been here for far too long um, <laughs> just curious about how how you've found ways to navigate cultures that don't fit um, and how you've been able to really lean into them and change the culture around it, even if it's small, right? It may not be that like you look up and the entire political landscape is different, but like what changes in the culture that you're in when you get it right? Whether it's your personal culture or your internal culture. I don't know if I ever got it right. I spent um, many years in Virginia and I spent a couple years in Ohio and those are both places that I felt I did not belong there, and I was made to feel that way, mm -hmm. um, especially in Ohio. Um, I left. I'm I'm sorry to say that, but I I left mm -hmm. Ohio very quickly. Um, with Virginia, I think it was more conflicted because I grew to love many people there, and I think that there was a pressure of of simply being present. Like I knew what it meant to be there. I knew what it meant to be participating in that community. And and I was happy to do that, but I also felt the pressure. Like, like I felt the pressure to, when I was asked to write a poem about Thomas Jefferson and Monticello, I knew why they asked me. Mm -hmm. It was because they had no one else in that table of contents who looked like me. Mm -hmm. And I, that's, a, that's, that's, that's hard to do. And it's hard to rec recognize that and feel that pressure. But on the other hand, if you say no, then how are you impoverishing that conversation? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if the culture has improved in either of those places or in any place that I've been in. I don't know. I, I just try. I think one of the things I was writing about in that poem at Pleasant was once I had children, I realized I had to be more engaged with my neighbors, that I couldn't be the shy, misanthropic person that I am at heart mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to say hello and I had to find out and then finding out about people was very worthwhile and I had to model a kind of citizenry citizenship mm -hmm. because I want my children to be part of a larger community than our our little family mm -hmm. I think I, I've spent a lot of time living in rural places and just kind of like far away from everybody and everything that I knew places. Um, real talk, I stayed inside a mm -hmm. lot. I stayed inside mm -hmm. um, because there wasn't any place to go. <laughs> you know, was, and it just didn't feel comfortable. And there were, then people, you know, made sure um, to let you know if, they were, if you were welcome or not. Mm -hmm. So I stayed inside. Mm -hmm. And which means that... <laughs> um, 
I feel like I spend a lot of time like walking from one end of my house mm -hmm. or my apartment to the other and just like looking out of the windows. And so like, I guess like during that period in my life, like a lot of my work I maybe reflects like inside looking out and always sort of being at a remove, um, but also like feeling the demand to like be present. Um, and usually it was, to, it was to be present for an institutional purpose. Mm -hmm. Like just to just to keep it real, you know, people wanting other people to see you to demonstrate something, to demonstrate some sort of success that they've achieved institutionally, um, and sometimes that was it was important to show up for that because there were people there that needed it. The institution didn't need it. The people who saw you did. <laughs> um, you know, so there, so there's always those pressures, um, or to perform or behave in a certain way, and I I mean. Did the cultures ch like change, like the small changes? Um, I think like I changed in response. Mm -hmm. You know, I, at some point I realized like, okay, what's the limit of, what's the limit of what I can handle? Mm -hmm. um, and is, is this like the kind of environment that I want to live in for the rest of my life? Yeah. The answer was no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I guess related to that question. Um, as it relates to culture, but also being in places where you're clearly unwanted. Um, you know, we're here with Cave Canem, with Kundiman, there's also Canto Mundo, um, all organizations that are there to support writers of color. Um, and I'm curious about what, how you define what it means to be in solidarity with other poets of color. And I'm, I'm I think I'm asking outside of sort of protesting together or speaking together as people of color, but what does that look like poetically? Um, and how do you relate to other writers of color who are maybe from different backgrounds? It's another big question, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, at this point in my reading life, I primarily read writers of color. So that's number one. Um, in my teaching life, I primarily teach writers of color. And what's, what's, I mean, fantastic about Kave Kanem and Kundiman um, is that, like, there's so much, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. and maybe this is where, you know, think about, like, changing the culture and where you're at. And I think about this very institutionally, um, where, uh, you know, I'm very much, or I can be the person who's like, what do you mean you don't? you didn't find any, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you weren't looking very hard, but don't worry, I can give you a list. You know, um, so, but to like amp and support the work mm -hmm. and to support um, the organizations, you know, that, that did some, they, they, st they stood in solidarity with me. So, uh, you know, I'm, by all means, I'm gonna stand in solidarity with them. Yeah, it, it's, I, I don't think I realized um, how lonely I was for these communities until I found one. Um, and it's, it, it's transformative to how you view the possibilities of your life as a writer and as an American citizen. Like you feel like, oh, I, there is a place that I belong. I can get out of my house. I don't have to pace in solitude. Um, I, I will say too that there, um, you know, I, I, I've traveled a lot in this last year for, for this book. And everywhere I go, I meet someone who is from Kundiman or Kabi Khanum or Kantamundo, and they say, oh, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just last week, I was in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and you know, I met a woman who's like, I did, I did Kundiman, I'm like, and I hugged her, mm -hmm. and we exchanged email addresses, and now we're Facebook friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's, it's just, there's, just, you know, and, and I know where she was, it was lonely, and she came to do the pressure that we were talking about, yeah. institutional work of being present, um, and we found each other. And so I think that um, there's a, it's almost like, you know, everywhere you go, there are these reunions with family that you didn't know were family. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like a very sentimental way to put it, but I, I yeah. think that like when I first realized that there were living writers, they were, I was excited about that, but they were all white, and they were all guys. And then when I realized that there was an Asian American poet named Lee Young Lee, I was like, "Oh my God!" Um, and and like and and that one, that first, that it's that first person is 
is like a, a door opening and mm -hmm. I just you keep finding more and more and more and now it's like it's it's a plenitude mm -hmm. it is it is the culture right yeah um, I think you it's we're doing the best writing right <laughs> <laughs> so I, I like no, but really though <laughs> I, I like the, I like that you said um you know there's like a door open because you know if you think about it you know, there were, um, and I was, you know, was very lucky. There were black poets who, like, literally held the door open for me. And then Kaveh Kanem opened a door and held it open. And if, if there's anything that I, that I think about in, like, the work that I do, or, you know, especially the teaching that I do, like, my, my sole job, really, you know, in some ways, is to keep holding the door open. And that's, you know, like, that's what I want to do. You know, anywhere mm -hmm. I go, it's like, hey, you know, you could, um, have you heard of Kaveh Have you yeah. heard of Kundiman? Have you heard of Kante Mundo? There are all these places for you. Um, and so that's what I try to do, mm -hmm. you know, as part of solidarity. It's yeah. like, you know, pay it, pay it forward. Yeah. And those things seem kind of basic, right? Like the idea that I'm going to read the people who may not look like me, but who I am in conversation with. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to open the door for the folks who I'm not yet in conversation with, but I should be. Um, and even though they, they sound simple and people sort of assume that they do that every day, um, it's really interesting to hear it from a place of intention, right? That like that is what it means to be in, in solidarity is to buy the book mm -hmm. and read it, right? And not buy it just because it's there, but to genuinely be invested in mm -hmm. the craft of it. Um, it's just, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna o begin to open up um, the experience to the audience, if you have any questions or thoughts. We'll do the good idea. repeat okay, so, the question. Um, this question over here. Okay. I was interested in, it is just an open-ended question, um, what you have to say about juxtaposition of images and um, telling a narrative through that. It's just because I started thinking about that recently. Uh, well, did everyone hear the question? Juxtaposition, Juxtaposition of images uh, in terms of narrative. But my first like gut gut response is that's like the best way. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's where like that's where the meat of it is. Like to me, like that's that's awesome, right? Because you know narratives are so complicated, and those juxtapositions open up a third space that I think is very, at least for me, is very crucial. So I'm down. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I'm curious about a word that came up, urgency. And a few other words that came up was the list and ordering and the ABC Darian lists are often organized by the alphabet. That's one of the primary ways we organize a list. So I'm wondering about the forms forms that have strong rhythm, for instance, repetitive rhythm, if you guys use that to create urgency, how do you get urgency through a form? I'm thinking of lists like My Cat Jeffrey. It's just very powerful yes. because it's just a list, even though it's just about a cat. Oh, so so how do the though. forms you, you use to, to like really generate the urgency? Yeah, um, insistence, I think, is one. Um, and also, what it, a lot of the forms that I use, um, the, the sorting and organization is entirely by chance. It's chance operation that chooses how much something appears. Um, but there's only a set number of things that can be chosen from. But what I like about it is that there are things that get insistently repeated. And it's not so much, I guess, like addition for the purposes of accretion, but each each time it's it's the emphasis, I think, increases. Um, and to me, that builds a sense of urgency. Like, yes, this you're gonna say it again, you know, because clearly, clearly, it has to be said again. 
a lot of things have to be said again because the same things keep happening. Um, so it's like, how do you how do you make someone listen? I don't know, but I think like repeating over and over again is one way. Um, um, the the for my cat Jeffrey is a lovely poem, and it's also very like chant like, and I think. Um, I like the way that that repetition can turn something into a very urgent chant, or at least an ominous one that calls into question like over and over again, what is it we believe? What is it we're doing? What are our responses going to be? What are our challenges going to be? Um, so I do think form can do that. Absolutely. I, mean, I think another way to think about urgency, as, at least as you, you're asking that question, is about speed, um, tempo, like when when um, the rhythm speeds up or when it slows down. And the form that I think is most helpful for that is syntax um, and how you structure your syntax. And when you introduce something like a list or when you introduced, uh, you know, dependent clauses or hypotaxis um, and when you break a line to affect um, the the imp it impacts the syntax and that you don't know where it's going and does that stop it or does that rush you forward? Um, so I think I think that's one way to do it. Um, I in in this book I don't think too much about form except in terms of the syntax the syntax of the poem um, and sometimes sentences are entire stanzas and they're one line and they're prose um, and that creates a different rhythm from. <clears throat> Like a really long, um, you know, stanza that's a whole page. Um, thank you guys for coming tonight. First of all, that was wonderful. Um, I was wondering if you couldn't speak a bit about editing and your editing process, um, unless you get it perfectly right the first time, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, but just what that process is like for you, how long, um, just speak a bit about editing. Stressful. <laughs> Stressful. <laughs> I spend a lot of time revising, and a, it's, it's we're in revising that I figure out what the poem is doing. And sometimes when I'm revising, um, especially with this book, I kept thinking about how to how to make the poem messier and how to resist uh, a clean ending. Like, I think one of the things I was most concerned about was what kind of ending would leave the poem wide open, uh, would, would resist resolution and yet still feel complete. Um, so, I mean, one reason I'm so slow is I spend so much time revising and I will, you know, I will literally change a poem's direction or what, opposed, opposed to how I intended to write the poem. And I think it's worth um, changing your mind or resisting your original attention, intention for mm -hmm. writing the poem, um, not being too wedded to what you think the poem is about. Because I think oftentimes our poems know more about what they want than we know about the poem, if that makes any sense. Yeah, um, yeah similarly, most of what I do is editing. <laughs> Most of it is revision. Um, when it comes to the computational work, the programs, like I run them one at a time. Like I literally run a, a stands at a time. And then if it looks, you know, like it's something I could work with, it goes in a document. But w what ends up, like I, I've generated hundreds and hundreds, you know, of stanzas. And so like the process for me is going through and saying, like, well, which ones, in which ones is the process of chance working the best for me, right? Does it sound the way I want it to sound? And then it's sort of like culling from that, and I'm like, okay, now I've got like 50 stanzas, you know, which ones of those do I do I want to work with? And then I can be like, well, now I have 10, um, and again, the process is very repetitive because it's just, it's sorting from the same things, but I want to change something in every single sort. Then I go and I, and I look for it and maybe like I change a word in every single one. So it's like a really, very much an ongoing process, but anything that, um, only, I think only one piece, one code here is, no, I edited that too. So, <laughs> so I was thinking, is there one that like I ran, I ran a program for a couple hours and it, 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 uh, the output was like, you know, 80,000 pages or something. And so it was like, 
Yeah, so it was like, no, I'm not, you know, I, I just sort of like went through and, you know, dealt with maybe like 40 of those pages or something. And then went from there and even still just like edited it because like the, the totally raw output is not always what I want. And I'm not, I'm not the, the, and there are a lot of poets who use computation, but I'm not the computational poet who, who just like leaves the output as is. Because, again, you know, again, like, you know, even my like using computation is a strategic response to the ways computation has been used, I think, which is very much again to demonstrate the code. And so part of what I'm thinking is like, I want this to be used to do something that is urgent. And so if it doesn't exactly do that, you know, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep in a stanza that doesn't do a thing simply because that's what the program did, you know, like. I'm, I'm not fa I don't have to be faithful yeah. to the program. <laughs> um, I'd also add that um, revision and editing is the most material aspect of writing, especially if you're working on the computer. And this goes back to Kamon's question about technology and like, the abstraction quality of writing now. Um, you actually get to get your hands dirty and you mess things up. And I think one thing that really helps me when I revise is looking at other art forms mm. and thinking about how is this shaped how does this end? Like, how does a painting end, for instance? And how can I bring that conception of an ending to a poem? Yeah. So, or even like, how does a film end? Or how does a scene in a film end? Um, so I think just shattering your preconceptions about what a poem should be um, is something that I always, I, I never want a poem to feel like a formula. Yeah, and I'll speak to that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll speak to that a little bit too. I think sometimes the poem comes before the writing for me. Not not often, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I'll sit with an idea for three weeks, maybe a month, mm -hmm. and then I sit down to push it out and it winds up being an entirely different poem than what I intended. Yeah. Um, and it's in those moments where I almost like require myself to not revise. Like I might edit, right, in terms of like how you rebuild the form on the page, how the syntax works, but it's in those moments where not editing and not revising feels almost like a personal resistance, like a resistance to myself of trying to fit my thoughts into a framework that just may not work. Um, and just being honest with yourself that like, what I thought I wanted to do with this poem is not either possible or not what it wants to do and just sort of leaving it there. And that's been weird because I think there's such a, um, there's a real, attachment to editing and revising that sort of like uh, insists that you, if you can revise, then you are a real writer. If you can revise, then you actually are invested in craft. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about what it means to not revise and to not edit and how that actually builds into a respect for craft. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I like that. I <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> um, any last questions? I think we'll do two more. So there was a controversial poem in the nation, I think back in like June. Oh so, yeah, I remember that. So um, are there any topics that you think are kind of like, well, this certain poet shouldn't talk about this, or is there anything that you stray away from when writing a poem or any restrictions or? That's hard because like I, my gut says there should be no topic that's off limits. And the problem with that poem was just, uh, this, he was disrespectful to the topic. He did not, um, I mean, there were just so many things wrong with that poem yeah. um, that it, it, was, it didn't have to do with subject matter. It had to do with actually like his, his own subject position and how he thought he, it's like he thought he understood the topic and he went into it with a certain kind of arrogance, I, I think, um, that made it seem like, the speaker was a, pup, a puppet of his whatever. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's gonna like pop out. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I know that it, it, that was a that was a particular um, that was an interesting thing that happened, <laughs> um, and I, I know a, a bit more about what that uh, what that writer was trying to do, um, and how they failed to do it. Mm. And um, 
should certain things be like off limits or whatever? Again, I'm not, I'm not in a position to say yes or no to that. But I do think like one of the, pro- maybe I guess like the problems with that poem, also it's like no, like know your moment, you know, like, like read the moment that you're in. You know, like there's definitely some things where I'm like, you know, do, do I, is my voice really needed here? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times the answer is no. Like, nobody needs to hear from me. Um, or, like, this thing that I want to talk about, like, now is not, it's not the time, you know? So there was something really tone deaf about that where it was like, you can go ahead and write whatever you want, but do think about, like, the context in which you're putting material out. And that was where I think there were, like, a lot of people and the editors, like, sort of failed to be like, okay, is this the right time to hear this kind of attempt from this kind of writer in this kind of subject position? And the answer clearly was no. Um, so I think, like, knowing the context and, like, where, where you're writing from, who you're writing to, and when you're writing is really important. Oh. It's all the nation. It's still bad enough there, bro. It's a hot mess. Yeah. Would have made a difference if there would have been a poet of color? There was. Right? There was. And real quick before we... One of the things that I was thinking in my head is part of the reason why it was... Why it felt so violent, the poem ended up... up. Oh, yeah. Sorry, girl. One of the reasons why it was so violent, right, is because he tagged all of these editors almost as to, like, absolve himself of responsibility from the actual content, wow. where he was like, look, all, all these writers of color signed off. And it was questionable and wow. really stressful, right, to, like, confront those writers and be like, what happened? How you do that? Right? But at the end of the day, there's only but so much that a person can do to push you away from the thing that just mm-hmm. doesn't work. And it, also, it just wasn't a good poem, so... Yeah, and it's, um, I don't, I we actually had a, I had a conversation with the author about it and what they were, and what was going on, um, and it's just, everything went wrong, <laughs> in, in a way, like, every, the, a lot of things just went wrong with it, but also, it, you know, in my mind, like, again, like, thinking about the editors, like, not just sort of like, okay, is this, is this the time? Is this really the right time? Like, I, and I was surprised. I was like, your, your job as editors, you're not really reading the moment well. Um, I want to stop here and leave space for folks to be able to talk to the authors, sign some books. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to throw them directly at the writers. Um, and they'll be here, and you can watch this um, on YouTube oh. when it goes up, and you can just remain in conversation with these poets and find them wherever they are. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer Chang, Lillian Yvonne Bertram, and Kimon Felix. Um, Everything that Kimon said, please be in conversation with the poets that are here before us. We have books in the back, um, as well as mailing lists for both Kundiman and Kave Kanam. And we'll be back at the New School on October 9th for a new works reading, so look out for that. All of our events are on our fall flyer. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.